It's eight o'clock, this is the UK Tonight. Not damaged enough. The families of sex offenders left to pick up the pieces, not classed as victims. They face a lifetime of trauma, stigma and shame without official access to support. We'll take you inside Lincolnshire Police's online paedophile investigations unit, where officers say families desperately need more help. Also coming up, the government sets out new plans to cut legal migration after figures reached a record high. People from overseas will now have to earn at least £38,000 to qualify for a visa, and care workers won't be allowed to bring their families with them. It might bring down the numbers, but what will it mean for the UK's skilled shortage? There could be new hope soon for nearly 3,000 people facing indeterminate prison sentences. Tonight, we'll hear Aaron's story. He was sentenced to prison for nearly two and a half years, but has now served more than 18. His sister, Cherry, will be with me later in the show. And after a bitterly cold weekend, hundreds of people are still without power in Cumbria. We'll hear how a small community there rallied to house dozens of stranded visitors. And have you got Riz? Not sure? Well, it's the Oxford University Press's Word of the Year. I'm going to be joined by Countdown Susie Dent to tell us what it actually means. All that's come and much more on The UK Tonight. Imagine finding out your husband was a sex offender, waking up one morning to a knock on the door and the police there to raid your home. Well, that was the reality for Sarah, a mum of two, whose husband was convicted of viewing hundreds of illegal child abuse images. Currently, the partners and children of offenders receive no automatic support to help them cope with the shame and trauma of their loved ones' crimes. And campaigners are calling for that to change. Tonight, MPs are going to debate whether there should be more help for relatives. Sky's Katerina Vitozzi spent time with Lincolnshire Police's online paedophile investigations unit, where officers say families desperately need more help. Two years ago, Sarah found out her husband was an online child sex offender. She had no idea what he'd been doing until police were at their door. He said, I've been arrested. And I said, what? What for? And he said, images. Just said the word, images. There was a lot of people talking to me. My children were crying in the living room. It was just chaos. The judgment was immediate, you know? The people were judging us as a family. So it was, it was just horrible. A year after his arrest, Sarah's husband was convicted of possessing over 500 indecent images of children aged 11 to 18. It would be easy to assume that her story is rare, but around 10,000 British families find out every year that a loved one is an online paedophile and they live with the stigma of that offence with little or no support. The police on the day left some leaflets with my husband, not with me, for support for himself. I don't think we matter that much. The families we've spoken to for this report have told us about the stigma and shame that they face as a result of their partners offending. Many have had to move home, their kids have changed school for fear of reprisal attacks. But despite all this, they are not officially recognised as victims, even indirect ones, under the government's current definition. And that means they can't access things like free psychological support counselling under victim support schemes. The Ministry of Justice have told us that currently they've got no plans to change that and that there are enough charities to support the families that need help. But those who see every day what's happening believe that's not enough. We were given rare and exclusive access to Lincolnshire Police's online paedophile investigation unit known as Pollitt. Hello, this is PC Scott from Lincolnshire Police. I believe my colleagues were around your house earlier. Um, PC Tom Scott's only job is supporting families who've just found out the unimaginable. There is a likelihood that there will be bail conditions placed on him that he won't be able to sleep at the home address and that It's a role unique to police forces in England and Wales. I've been told by several families that 
if they didn't have this me or this role to go to, then there are times where they wouldn't be there anymore. There are a lot of charities out there for domestic violence, drug addiction, these sorts of things. But for this, that is specific to this, where that recognises the trauma, the stigma that goes along with the offence, there's not as many. Why do you think that is? I would say the, the explosion in the offence itself, the volume has exponentially increased over the last few years and we need to catch up. But there is no government or criminal justice mandate for there to be any automatic support from police forces, victim services or local authorities. It comes down to funding and resources, doesn't it? So if I was being cynical, I might suggest that, you know, the government don't want to do recognise these indirect victims because it's going to cost more. And campaigners believe the price is families like Sarah's living with the shame of a crime of which they are totally innocent. And Katerina joins us now from Manchester. Uh, Katerina, MPs due to debate this issue uh, this evening. We're keeping across that here on Sky News. Uh, but this gives victims, well, they're not seen as victims, are they? But it gives the families of those who have committed these crimes some hope that it's getting the attention it deserves. Yeah, I think from speaking to the families that we have, speaking to the police forces and the campaigners, there's been a sense for such a long time that these families were unheard and unseen. And that stems from many families being told to isolate th themselves, to not speak to family, not to speak to friends, not to tell people at their work what their offending partner, husband, dad or son may have done for fear of reprisal attacks affecting them as well. So it's taken a lot of work driven by people who've been through it, through campaigners, uh, to try and get the debate to this point. Now, what MPs will be discussing this evening is whether children specifically of people who have carried out these sorts of crimes or, or who are suspected of carrying out these crimes could be officially recognised as victims. And that would mean, crucially, that there would be automatic support from them from the moment of that arrest. You got just a flavour in my report of how life-changing this is for partners, but also uh, for children of offenders or suspects of child online sex offences. So for there to be an automatic mechanism where they can obtain free counselling would go some way to try and address some of the trauma, some of the stigma that they face as a result of this crime. Because research has shown that in that moment, from the moment that the police raid a person's home, a partner's home, the children and the partner of that offender will face possibly levels of stress akin to post-traumatic stress disorder. That is how serious it is and that is what MPs will be discussing tonight. Katerina, thank you. Uh, earlier on today, I spoke to Heather. That's not her real name. Uh, she is another woman who had the devastating experience of discovering that her partner had committed online child sex offences. To protect her identity, we're not showing her face in this interview. Where could you turn? Where could you get support from? The police don't liaise with families. We're not witnesses. We're not victims. We're not victims in the Victims Code anyway, so they don't stay in contact with us. Children's Services signed us off as a family within two weeks. We were never given a, ch a social worker. Um, I was deemed a good enough protective factor, thankfully, um, and they recommended supervised access only. So even though my relationship with him had ended, mm -hmm. he was still my children's father. So, you know, they were just going to... You know, he lived around the corner. How could I explain that he, they couldn't see him anymore and we bump into him in Asda, you know? So so Children's Services didn't help me at all because they signed us off and it was kind of like, well, there you go, crack on, get on with supervised access. Um, and the, the practical, emotional and psychological ramifications of supervised only access is just so hard. Um, I don't think, I don't think agencies realise how much that impacts family life. Well, if you scan the QR code on your screen, you can listen to the rest of that interview. It's on today's Sky News Daily podcast. It's been seen as a government failure 
the inability to bring down migration to the UK. It was a key Conservative pledge at the last election and it's trebled to a record high since then. This afternoon, the new Home Secretary, James Cleverley, has outlined a series of new measures aimed at reducing the number of people legally moving to the UK. Well, under these plans, overseas care workers won't be able to bring their families to the UK, but they will be exempt from a new requirement for skilled workers to earn at least £38,700 a year to be eligible for a work visa. Rules that allow foreign workers to be hired at 20% below the going rate are going to be scrapped and rules for family visas are going to be tightened so that people have to earn more before their dependents can come to the UK. Sky's Communities correspondent Becky Johnson has this report from Somerset. What do you want your coffee? Mm. Coffee, drink coffee, yeah. That's tea. Femia applied for her job at this care home in Somerset so she could move to Britain with her husband and three children. She says where she's from in India, agents sell paperwork for care visas in the UK. If you are going through agency, they are asking like 10,000 pounds or some, some more than. Now this year they are asking more. And you know people who've paid that? Yeah. To come to the UK? Yeah, my friends. It's that kind of abuse and exploitation that the government wants to crack down on, as well as cutting numbers. But there's concern that banning migrants from bringing their families will make it much more difficult to recruit the foreign care workers needed to staff care homes and hospitals. I think there'll be an implosion of social care and possibly of the NHS as well. Why? Because I feel strongly that the majority of people will want to bring their dependents very few people want to leave young children at home while they're uh, trying to start a new life for themselves and their family without their family here. Lee, who came from South Africa to work as a healthcare assistant in Cambridge, says it wouldn't have stopped her. I would have still come to the UK because it's, an, it's more of a necessity that I can manage to take care of my family. But it's also on a downside that I can't be with my children, I can't be with my family. It's, it honestly is something that is no human being can be put under that much pressure. The huge numbers of jobs that need filling mean health workers won't have to be paid the new, much higher minimum salary for skilled migrants. Other sectors, like hospitality, warn they'll be hit hard. But this overhaul of the immigration system is designed to cut record migrant numbers to appeal to the many voters who want to see fewer people coming to the UK. Becky Johnson, Sky News, Somerset. Hundreds of people across northeast and northwest England are still without power tonight after a bitterly cold spate of weather over the weekend. And although the snow is easing up, both the Met Office and the Environment Agency have several warnings in place for ice, rain and flooding. There's a yellow warning for ice across northern Scotland and the Shetland Islands until tomorrow morning. And there is also a yellow rain warning in the northeast of England until tomorrow morning. Our chief North of England correspondent, Greg Milam, reports from Oveston in Cumbria. They pride themselves on working through all weathers up here. Even so, this is the worst many say they've seen for a decade. And driving over the hillsides today, it was clear that what's left of that heavy snow continues to block roads to some rural communities. And digging out has begun for others. And butcher Peter Hutchinson preparing to make deliveries to those who can't make it out. It's a long time since it snowed like that. Yeah, a long time. But it was just regional, it was just here, you know, uh, Blackpool, which used to just across the bay, there was nothing. The sun was shining on Saturday. Oh, same. Yeah, just the same, yeah. It was just regional, it's just one of them things you have to get on with it. But we're country people, so you just get on with it, and everybody helps where they can help. What makes me mad is people grumbling about the emergency services, because, you know, they're doing their best. Because yeah, yeah. we're farmers, so we've got the gear to clear it out and everything, but anyone that's not is a bit stuck. I'm like electrics are. Work to restore that power to most of the remaining few hundred homes should be completed overnight. We are used to snow in the, in the Lake District, um, but to come down at such a, a rate has been some of the challenge and the weight of the snow on the lines has caused the problems with the network and extensive damage. 
For those still without power, vans providing hot food were laid on. Over the weekend, the fire service was called out to rescue a number of people who'd been trapped in their cars. So intense was the snowfall. And even now, mountain rescue teams are out in some of the more remote parts of the Lake District, carrying out checks on those who haven't been able to leave their homes yet. Across the Lake District, dozens of schools were closed. But the big thaw has started. As one of this area's favourite sons might say, that will mean another fine mess. Winter has definitely arrived. Greg Milam, Sky News, Cumberland. Well, many people across Cumbria became stranded as the snow set in over the weekend. We can speak now to Judith Myers, who joins me from the Lake District. She ended up looking after more than 40 people in her guest house in the village of Hawkshead after they became stranded in the snow at the village fair. Judith, good evening to you. Good evening. Talk to me about what happened. Well, it wasn't quite the guest house. It was actually a scout and guide building. Girl Guiding runs um, a bunkhouse in Hawkshead. Uh, we have 32 bunk beds. And this weekend, it happened to be the Christmas fair, luckily. So um, lots of us had gone along. There was a young leader who was raising money to go to India with Girl Guiding next year. And uh, we'd taken along a brownie stall to sell things, uh, namely cakes and delicious treats, luckily. So uh, I bet they all to, went, Judith. Due to the snow, uh, we didn't have many customers, so it ended up uh, that the uh, people staying overnight were quite lucky. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> if you're going to get stuck anywhere, stuck, get stuck some, somewhere where there's cake. And um, so, Judith, obviously running a B and B, your hospitality genes kicked in. What was it like for people there overnight? How did you all get through it, apart from the cake and cups of tea? <laughs> well. Um, being used to dealing with a lot of people with uh, in girl guiding and scouting and things like this, once people started to ask us, did we have a spare bunk, um, it was soon easy to fill it with. We had a ladies' dormitory and a male dormitory, and then we had two family rooms with four beds in. So we filled them first, and then, unfortunately, lots of people had to uh, camp out on the floor or sit in chairs. Uh, but the village rallied around and I put it on Facebook uh, that we needed bedding and supplies down there. So people made soup and uh, were really good. It was a lovely, it was actually really very nice. And the people who were staying there were uh, saying they're going to have a five-year reunion at the <laughs> uh, fair in five years' time. Oh, well, hopefully they'll bring a bit of money to buy some cake next time rather than having to take it um, to get them through the night. But, Judith, on a serious note, I mean, obviously you know only too well how quickly the weather changes there and there are weather warnings in place, but people do still seem to get caught out. Well, I think um, in an area like ours where there's lots of mountains and hills, it can change just over the hill from Hawkshead Hill to Coniston. And there was lots of people this time stranded in Coniston as well. And the hospitality there down at Sports and Social and other places was really good. The um, church in Hawkshead opened up, as did the school. And lots of people, residents, took others in. So it was really good. Yeah, a community spirit, you know, warms the heart and actually warms you up because you know I'm just looking at some of the beautiful pictures from your part of the world and it really is scenic very wintry very Christmassy but as a community how do you take care of the vulnerable people that live in and amongst you because you know we hear so much at this time of year about the elderly particularly suffering and being vulnerable when the snow comes down. I think in a small village like ours, everyone knows their neighbours and it's very easy to know someone who needs something. And I don't think there would be anyone in the villages around here that wouldn't be cared for or mm. somebody would knock on the door or give them a ring and see if they were OK and take them something if needed. Oh, Judith, that's really good to hear. And I think you need a, a new badge made up for the Girl Guides <laughs> and, and the Scouts, perhaps. For, for what swung into action over the weekend. Um, I'll let you think on that one. You guys are the experts. But thank you so much for joining us, Judith. Really good to talk to you on the UK tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> good night.
Uh, well, still to come on the UK tonight, Sir Keir Starmer. Uh, he says he won't be splashing the cash if he wins the next election. Details of his big speech today on the way. Also ahead, after 12 years, the UK's only two giant pandas have begun their long trip back home to China. And do you have Riz? Do you even know what that means? I didn't until today. Uh, we'll explain Oxford's word of the year after the break. From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. You must not meet socially in groups of more than six. And if you do, you will be breaking the law. There was no party and that, and that no COVID rules were broken. The reason there's no evidence to show that uh, I must have known, or I, I, I must have believed that uh, illegal events were taking place is because I didn't. We use the, uh, the Newfoundlands for emotional support. So we take military veterans, um, emergency service staff, people with disabilities, and it, anybody who wants a fun swim, uh, swimming in open water with the dogs, and the results are just amazing, just incredible. So tell me what he does. He goes it, swimming with yeah, them? Yeah, he swims with people, yeah. So what we do is we get people turn up. Whether We have six at a time. Um, we get them in a wetsuit, buoyancy aid, dry suit, whatever. Um, we swim out 30, 40 metres. The dogs then swim out to, to us and he pulls them back to shore. Everything we do is so simple, but it's massively effective. What is it, it about dogs? Oh, I said, it's the loyalty, the comradeship, you know, it's everything about them. The fact that they want to be with you all the time. You can leave the house for five minutes and come back in wagging the tails. You can leave the house for four hours, the same thing. You know, they're just so pleased and so loyal and just brilliant. And, and they the, calm the, people, don't they? Abs he, these do. I mean, he's, he's probably saved himself probably a couple of lives by his demeanour with people. So, as you saw, then he puts his head on my lap. Now, he tends to find people that are in a bad place and he'll sit with them. Um, when we're actually in the water, um, and because we have people sat in the water with them, so we've got like a pat dog in the water with, while they're waiting for their turn to swim. If someone's got a bit of an issue, he tends to find it and he goes and puts his paws on the shoulders and sits there with them and looks around and that. Oh, it's fantastic to see. I'm Greg Milam and I'm Sky's Chief North of England Correspondent. Hello, there you are. Welcome back. You're watching the UK tonight. Uh, now, just before the break, we asked you if you knew what Riz meant, spelt R I double Z. Uh, the Oxford University Press has just named it uh, the word of the year. Uh, well done for those of you at home who know what it is. Uh, for those who didn't, like me, uh, Riz is apparently defined as style, charm, or attractiveness, the ability to attract a romantic or sexual partner. Well, there you go. We're going to be chatting uh, to Susie Dent, Countdown Susie Dent, about Riz a little bit later in the show. Also coming up, could there be new hope for people facing indeterminate prison sentences? This is as MPs vote on an amendment to a bill to change the rules. And Sky has won the broadcast rights to a record number of Premier League football matches. We'll bring you the details shortly. Now, let's take a look at some of the other stories making news in the UK tonight. Investigators looking into a fatal explosion at a house in Edinburgh are focusing on internal gas installations. An 84-year-old man named locally as James Smith died in the blast on Friday evening. The health and safety executive believe gas installations inside the home caused the explosion, 
rather than the wider gas network which supplies the area. A 43-year-old woman and a 54-year-old man were also injured. Footballer Ravel Morrison has admitted fraud after using a dead person's blue badge permit to park his car. Manchester magistrates heard Mr Morrison bought the permit for £50 from someone in Old Trafford and used it while parking in the city in May. The 30-year-old, who now plays for DC United, pleaded guilty to fraud and was fined £1,000. He was also ordered to pay more than £500 in costs and a victim surcharge of £400. The Foreign Secretary has met some of the British relatives of those taken hostage by Hamas. Now, you may remember last week here on the programme, we spoke to Stephen Brisley. You'll see him here on the left of this picture. Three of his family members were killed in the Hamas attack and two are still being held hostage. He told us in the UK tonight that the government hadn't yet done enough to support him. Well, today, he met the new Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, who said he will work tirelessly to help bring the hostages home. The UK's only two giant pandas are on their way back home to China after 12 years. Tian Tian and Yang Yang came to Edinburgh Zoo back in 2011 as part of a 10-year loan deal, which was later extended. But it's now time for them to head home. Uh, the pandas are going to travel in specially designed crates during the long flight, accompanied by a zookeeper and a vet. The Labour leader has said today that he won't turn on the spending taps if his party wins the next general election. Uh, speaking earlier today, Sir Keir Starmer warned that the UK will face huge constraints on public spending if Labour win. It comes as the Resolution Foundation think tank warned that the average household in the UK is more than £8,000 worse off than those in France and Germany. It will be a hard road to walk. No doubt about it. And anyone who expects an incoming Labour government to quickly turn on the spending taps is going to be disappointed. Inflation, debt, taxes are now huge constraints. So to come on the UK tonight. Where is the library? <laughs> Don De yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why a growing number of pupils are now choosing not to study foreign languages at school. And speaking of language, would you know if you were in a situationship? Do you even know what one is? Stay with us to find out more.
Hello, welcome back to the UK tonight. Now, just before the break, I asked you if you knew what the word situationship meant. It is another one of the Oxford University Press's words of the year. Apparently, it means a romantic relationship that is not considered to be formal or established. Uh, we'll have more on the words of the year with Countdown Susie Dent coming up at the end of the show. Now, tonight, there could be new hope for nearly 3,000 people facing indeterminate prison sentences. MPs are voting tonight on amendments to the Victims and Prisoners Bills, which includes the resentencing of so-called IPP prisoners who are held indefinitely until parole boards approve their release. Well, it's a story that Sky's Alice Porter has been following this year and she joins me now in the studio. Um, so, Alice, let's start at the very beginning. Um, what is an IPP? An IPP is Imprisonment for Public Protections and they were designed to be given to serious offenders whose crimes didn't warrant a whole life sentence. So you'd be given a minimum term that you'd serve in prison, such as two years, but there'd be no maximum, so it was entirely open-ended. And it was hoped that it would give a degree of flexibility uh, to see how somebody was progressing within prison, and they were really designed to be given to those serious offenders. The problem is they were ended up being given out far more widely than initially anticipated, and in many cases they were given to people who had committed quite low-level crimes. So, for example, we know of somebody who's been held in prison in this country for 11 years for stealing a mobile phone. Mm. The government got concerned about this. In the end, they abolished the sentence in 2012. The problem is they didn't do this retrospectively. So that's why there are still almost 3,000 IPP prisoners in the country. And around 600 of them are, have been in prison almost a decade over the minimum term they were meant to serve. So this has led to a huge amount of outcry. We've had the UN Special Rapporteur for Torture. She has accused the British government of psychological torture in an interview exclusively with Sky News. Uh, and this has led to concerns within government as well. Uh, the Justice Select Committee last year, they conducted uh, a very thorough inquiry into the situation and their recommendation was that IPP prisoners should be resentenced. And I think really crucial to stress this, resentencing is not opening the doors. It would be going through each case individually. And there are some IPP prisoners who have been very dangerous and they would continue to be in prison. But there are other people who would make much more sense to allow them to have some hope to work towards being released because, and we'll hear this coming from Sherry in a little bit, but a lot of these prisoners have no sense of hope. And so unsurprisingly, they have very poor mental health problems. Their suicide rate is more than two and a half times uh, the general prison population. And so Bob Neal, who chairs uh, the select committee on this, he has tabled an amendment today calling on the government to resentence IPP prisoners because Dominic Rogg previously rejected those proposals. OK, well, that's all unfolding tonight. There's a debate and then a vote. We will keep across it here on Sky News. Alice, I know you're following this for us very closely. Uh, thank you. Well, um, one of the cases that Alice just mentioned there, uh, one of the people facing an indeterminate sentence is Aaron. Now, Aaron Graham was 26 years old when he was sentenced to two years and 124 days in prison for committing grievous bodily harm. Uh, the victim was left with a broken cheekbone. That was back in 2005. And 18 years later, Aaron is still in prison. His sister, Sherry, accepts that he deserved the time he was originally sentenced to, but now, she says, he doesn't pose a risk and she's longing for the day that he will be released. Uh, well, Sherry Nicholl joins me now here in the studio. Sherry, hello. Nice to meet you. Just looking at that picture of you and your brother, Aaron, there, Essentially, he got into a fight yeah. and was charged and sentenced for GBH. Just over two years was his minimum sentence, but as part of this IPP, there was no maximum. Did you ever think you'd be in a situation where 18 years later he is still in prison? Absolutely not. I don't think anybody would ever think they would be in that situation. Um, some, well, to say 20 years, he was on two years remand, so he's been in 20 years, and it's just absolutely heartbreaking. What has been happening in that time? Because presumably both you and Aaron, the rest of your family and friends thought, well, you know, it could be two years, maybe five, not 18. How has he tried to, to get released in that time? What have you been doing? What have lawyers been doing? And what's, what's been the blocker? What's been stopping his release? I just think um, 
like many IPPs, he hasn't had a voice. Mm -hmm. And there's been instances where he could have been progressed. Mm -hmm. Now he's done four years without a parole. So in that time, he could have been progressed. And it seems to be that, you know, all the time, there's, there's new staff come in or there's not enough measures or there's not enough courses. It's inadequate. Mm. It's inadequate. So it was abolished, but it's all inadequate. And it seems to be that they're all forgotten and we're no further forward. Yeah, well, the government did see that this measure was inadequate, as you put it, so they abolished it. Yeah. But there are over 3,000. Aaron is one who's still in prison. And you mentioned there about there not being enough staff, enough being not being enough courses, because... If you're given an IPP, it's up to you to prove to the parole board yep. that you're not a risk to the public anymore. But in order to do that, you have to tick certain boxes, go, go on courses yep. that prove that you're rehabilitated. Has Aaron had access to those or is, is that a gap in the system? Because, you know, Alice Porter, I was talking to her earlier and she said some prisons say, we just don't have them here. We just don't have access yes, to these courses. Yes, they, they do get shipped around. They don't always have the courses. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day... Um, if, if obviously somebody's going on before them, they're not going to get on that course. Mm. And there's a certain tick, tick box exercise, as you were, but not mm. one, one size fits all. So, you know, it's, it's when they've done so long over tariff, mentally, can they cope to do things? Mm. Is it realistic to keep punishing them and putting them through the courses and things like that? And then you've got, it gets to parole, and then they decide, you don't have to do this, you do have to do this. Mm. There's a massive, like, confusion mm. There's no clear understanding of what they have to do because the parole boards are so different all the time mm. or the, the, the probation are different all the time. So it's like moving the goalposts they, constantly. They keep getting him. moved. And mm. this, what happens is the mental health deteriorates so much that they just can't cope. And you can't expect somebody to cope in an environment that's absolutely crucifying mm. them. And this is why the re-sentence is, is so, so important mm. Because it, what it does, it paints a picture of, of services working together to progress them. Then, then we wouldn't have this. Mm. It's just we're just stuck in the mud. And it's like people like my brother, yes, he got into a fight, but he's been in there 20 years and he's sitting in a cell. He's sitting in a cell like 23 hours a day. How is that going to rehabilitate anybody? Mm. You know? What's it been like for him for the last 20 years? You've been with him every step of the way as much yeah. as you can be, of course. You know, how often... Do you see him? I try and see him um, once a month, always, and come up to Christmas, because he's spending another Christmas, you know, and birthdays. Mm -hmm. um, I see him as much as I can. Because and, he and needs what's the change support. been in him in the last 20 years? Because obviously, you know, he did commit a crime. Yeah. He expected to serve time. You know, that's an accepted fact. Yeah. But over the last 20 years, what's, what's been the change? Well, you what's mature. Done to him? He was in his 20s when he went in. Mm. He's now 43 years old. You know, he's sitting there as a man. And he's done a lot of inner work on himself. And you know, he's sitting there reflecting. He's, he's, he's overly punished, like many of them. And you know, as I'm sat here, I'm lucky that he's still here, to be fair, because there has been, you know, nearly 90 suicides because of it. And I don't want... The reason why I campaign like I do, and, and many of my friends, I don't want to lose my brother. So, you know, it's, I, 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 I admire him for his strength because I don't, know if, I don't think I could do it. Well, look, he's very lucky to have a sister like you who's giving him a voice. But it's hard. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine it is. It's been, you yeah. know, 20 years that, that you've been talking about this and, uh, and campaigning more recently. What do you want to see come fr from tonight? Because MPs are debating it within the next half an hour, voting yeah. on it. Why is it so vital that resentencing happens for those around 3,000 people on Be IPPs? Because we want to prevent further suicides... We want the mental torture. There's, they want to free up prison spaces. Well, there's people in for petty crimes doing doing a life sentence. Um, if we, do, I mean, I said this like months ago before this was even implemented, and and Sir Bob Neil's done an amazing job, and it's really stressful for him to be on the front line and take that responsibility. But what I would like to see is a resentence, and it doesn't mean let's open the floodgates and let everybody home. It means that we're actually doing something about it and taking responsibility. And what we are doing is, is, is we're massively setting an organisation of what we're going to do about it. We need, we need, no one's got any organisation. So before you know it, my brother's going to be in 25 years because he said and she said that he didn't do this course but he's on his knees. How can he? How can he rehabilitate an environment that makes him so sick, mm. and like others before him? So, what I would like to see is a sister 
for me and for all the IPPs mm -hmm. is that the resentencing comes into force on a case-by-case -case basis. We get a set amount of time of what we have to do to get them where they need to be. That's fair, you know? Well, Sherry, uh, thank you so much for coming on to talk to us on behalf of your thank brother, you. Aaron, and we'll keep a close eye on this debate and this vote tonight and uh, we'll update Sky News viewers as to what happens. Thank you for taking the time to come and see us. Oh, thank you, welcome. really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, well, if you've been affected by anything uh, that we've just been discussing there, you can contact the Samaritans. 116123 is the number or email joe at samaritans.org. Uh, now, on to something a little different. A new report today has found that growing numbers of pupils are choosing not to study a foreign language at GCSE level because they don't think it's going to help them in a future career. A survey by the British Council found that while children enjoy learning languages, they don't see their value beyond the age of 14. But even though pupils don't seem to be studying foreign languages, there is some good news for fans of the Welsh language. Duolingo says the number of people studying Welsh on the app has hit 3 million for the very first time. Uh, well, earlier we called up with the people of South London and asked how many languages they could speak. I did Spanish at school, so... That I found useful, but I think it's also because I've always spoken a second language, so it came a lot easier and there are very similarities. I don't know, the stuff we learnt was very, like, specific. Like, where is the library? <laughs> Don... De yeah. No. <laughs> Do you think it's important to kind of have another foreign language in the curriculum? Yes, but I think there should be more variety, because most schools do Spanish and French. I speak Chinese as another language, yeah, and I think um, I would have liked that to be an option. Can we have a phrase, though, in either of your two languages that you learned? The only thing I remember from Japanese is Dengabungawa, which means this is my number, so not useful <laughs> at all. Could be, could be useful, could be useful. I'll pick someone up, maybe. <laughs> well, I think technology kind of bridges the gap now, so maybe it's less of a necessity because technology eases that. It's quite a, it's a diverse country, so it's good to know other languages so you can speak with other people. It's because we didn't use the languages in real life, so it didn't stick with us. Right. So we just learnt it for the sake of learning for the exam, but it didn't really, we didn't really use it in real life. Uh, now, Sky Sports has won the rights to broadcast a record 215 Premier League matches from next year. This is after finalising a new four-year agreement. It means exclusive live coverage will increase by 70%. That's 7 0. That's a lot of football. Our sports correspondent Rob Harris uh, joins me now in the studio. Rob, tell me more. Well, it extends the Premier League's relationship with Sky that began all the way back in 1992 with a whole new ball game and the launch of the Premier League era. And so much is resting on the steel, not only for the Premier League, but also. Sky News' parent company, Sky, by having these rights and having more games than ever before. This addresses some of those issues fans have raised, like yesterday afternoon when at two o'clock there were four games happening, but only one was actually live on Sky. And it's not to do with the broadcaster, but the Premier League and how they sell the rights. Now, the only matches that won't be live in this country will be in that three o'clock Saturday blackout window with TNT, owned by Discovery, holding the other package. But what the outcome of this is, that Sky will have... Most of the rights, 100 more games per season with the, these deals, including every game on the final day of the season. And financially, how does it impact things? Well, this deal is worth over four years, £6.7 billion, which is only up 4%. Perhaps the clubs would want more to spend on transfers, but it means for Sky in particular and TNT, they'll weigh that when it comes to subscription costs. Yeah, a lot of money for a lot of football. Rob, thank you. Uh, coming up on the UK tonight, uh, we're going to stick with football. Uh, could we be about to see the first managerial sacking of the Premier League season? Uh, we'll be talking changes at struggling Sheffield United. And do you know where a Swifty is? Of course you do. Uh, it is not this. <laughs> uh, that is very much not a Swifty. Um, we'll tell you what it is. Of course you know. Uh, it's one of the words of the year. Find out more after the break with Countdown Susie Dent. Even I know what a Swifty is.
I'm Inzamam Rashid and I'm Sky's North of England correspondent telling stories from this culturally rich region I call home. It's going to become very similar to other places and lose its unique qualities. It's steeped in history. If the Taliban found your family, what would happen? I think they're just going to straight away execute them. There are issues of racism in all levels of cricket. I was in the balcony a couple of times. I was nearly gone. Football is a joy to watch and uh, when people are disappointed, you can feel the hate. I just felt physically sick, so I was like, that, that's really in my system. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. Even before the pandemic, GPs were pleading for help. Government expects more face-to-face -face contact with patients in return. Men, they want to force you doing something which you don't want to do. Just because you're homeless and you're looking for a warm place to sleep. We give a voice to communities often unheard and unserved from a region with a distinct history and global impact. Hello, welcome back to the UK tonight for the break. We asked you if you knew what a swift year is. I mean, hang on tight. I'm sure you know this one. Uh, but we'll be joined by Countdown Susie Dent to explain what a swift year is and many other words. Uh, they're all words of the year from the Oxford University Press. The official top word of the year is Riz. I'm looking at Nick Powell, <laughs> who's here with his voice. Do you know what Riz is? I didn't until today. No. There's no shame if you don't know. And Swifty rings a bell. Yes. I did, um, I, we showed a, a picture of the Sheffield United manager earlier talking about Swifty and I did him a disservice by saying that's nothing to do with a Swifty. He might be a Swifty, uh, but he might be moving on swiftly. Yes, uh, it sounds from all our sources as though Paul Hackenbach is going to be sacked. And he's going to be the first Premier League manager to lose his job. It's only the fifth time we've got to this stage, December the 4th, mm. since the Premier League was started 30 years ago, that we've got this far without any... Premier League sacking. So I think some clubs are just looking to be a bit more cautious. It costs a lot of money to sack a manager mm. and all his assistants and bring in another one with all his assistants. I'm still saying his. The, the day when it is maybe hers will come. Yeah. Um, and and you know, are we going to do better with anybody different? But Sheffield United finally have decided that after one win so far in 14 games this season, and that was by an injury time penalty, um, the time has come to, to get rid of Paul Heckingbottom. By the sound, of it, not confirmed yet, but that all our sources are saying that is very, very imminent. Yeah, it's been talked about all day, hasn't it? We were hoping we could get to a record after Christmas without a getting rid of a Premier League manager, but he could be the first to go. Talk about who could replace him already, as is the nature of these things. Well, it's going to be Chris Wilder, by, by all accounts, okay. who is the man who um, famously took up Sheffield United from the third tier, League One, mm -hmm. up into the Championship, the second tier, and then up again into the Premier League, and then finished in the top half of the Premier League by playing a very adventurous, um, different, innovative style of football, innovative tactics... Um, and it sounds like he is coming back in, but it's a really stiff task. They're, they're at the bottom, they're struggling, they've got a transfer embargo, they haven't got very much money. It's going to be tough. Yeah, OK. Nick, what else is coming up? Uh, well, let me tell you what else is happening, because there's news from Manchester United today as well. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people, more active. Live life with Vitality. Welcome to Old Trafford. Thanks very much. You're a man of many talents, but we're interested in you today for one major reason. Okay. Season ticket holder at Manchester United, and you tell me you're in the way. I Come think on. I believe I'm in I'm in the E of Manchester towards the, the the back of that bottom tier there. Every time I sort of do a, a, a job or sign on to something, I always think, well, at least that's my season ticket secured <laughs> for another season. It's always my priority. Yeah, I'd, I'd hate to be 
without it. Yeah. And you have any recollection of that the first time you actually walked through the steps or the pitch, saw the players? I, I, just, I just couldn't believe it. I, I, I've got very, very clear memories of that game. It was New Year's Day uh, 2003 and we played Sunderland uh, at Old Trafford. And it was, it, was kind of, it was kind of the perfect first game to go to, really. That was in the era when we, when we, had, we had Scalzi starting, we had, we had Beckham starting, we had Keno starting. And I just couldn't believe that I was seeing them all of a sudden. So this is David Beckham asking you for a picture. Look how happy he is to be posing with you. I know. <laughs> and, and, and the weird thing about it was that, you know, in, in Dave, David Beckham's not somebody who maintains a look for very long. I don't know how long he kept that for, but... I this Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Right, let's take a quick look at the weather picture. Warm memories wherever you go. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. It's turning unsettled and a bit milder, but there will still be some wintry conditions around over the next couple of days. It's going to be windy this evening, gales near southwestern coasts. Central and southern Britain, rather murky with outbreaks of locally heavy rain, but there'll be just a scattering of mainly coastal showers elsewhere. Southern Scotland and the southwest of England will see cloud and rain giving way to a scattering of showers overnight. While the rest of England and Wales will remain overcast with increasingly patchy rain. Most other places looking clear with just a few coastal showers, but eastern parts of Northern Ireland will be wet for a time. It's going to turn frosty in the north and the west. England and Wales will see the last of today's rain fading tomorrow morning with sunny spells developing in the north and the west. But eastern parts will see a scattering of showers moving in. Most other places will be fine. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Now, a team of experts and tens of thousands of public votes selected Riz as the word the most captures 2023. And if you don't already know what it is, it's used mainly by Gen Z to describe someone's ability to attract a romantic partner. Other words in the shortlist from the Oxford University Press included prompt, meaning an instruction given to an artificial intelligence programme algorithm. Uh, which determines or influences the content it generates. Uh, in other words, situationship, which means a romantic or sexual relationship that's not considered to be formal or established. And Swifty, you know this one, you kind of escaped it. It means an enthusiastic fan of the singer Taylor Swift. Well, lexicographer and Countdown's very own Susie Dent joins me now. Um, Susie, to my shame, I did not know what Riz was until today. <laughs> um, where did it come from? Oh, it's just spiked in the usage graph so much uh, this year, Sarah Jane. And it comes, it's a shortening of charisma, um, mm -hmm. essentially. And it's that's quite a productive way of creating new words, actually, is just lifting the middle of the part of the word. We have fridge and flu and a similar sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and it has suddenly taken off on TikTok. Uh, there are many riffs on it. It's a verb. It's a noun. Um, and the way that we analyse these things, and as you say, it was put to the public vote, which I think was brilliant because English moves democratically not by authority and then was mediated by Oxford University Press they were looking at the data and just saw how often people were using it how differently they were using it you know quite quickly it was evolving very quickly in lots of different ways so you could tell it was going to be a stayer so how would you use Riz um, you would use it as in um, he's got great Riz or um, someone would be rizzing you up, for example. There are now riz techniques. Um, there are, I mean, we might reach peak riz before too long, and that would be another variation. <laughs> um, but it's interesting. It is, as you say, it's quite a generational thing. So um, in my experience, asking anyone under 30, they immediately know what riz is. And yeah. it might seem slightly frivolous, but I think so many of the words on Oxford shortlist were actually to do with dating, to do with relationships. And I think maybe after the pandemic, you know, we are reanalyzing who we are and how we how we interact with other people. Um, and as you say, you know, Gen Z, I mean, a lot of young people occupying that online space and suddenly propelling these words out there. And then they're slipping into the mainstream as well. So they're not restricted to a certain group. 
Yeah, I know you love the evolution of language, Susie, and you also like talking about words that have fallen out of fashion as well. Yeah. I want to ask you a bit about that, but having had a look at that list that's come out today, Riz, of course, topping it, was there anything on there that you particularly liked and why? I really liked parasocial, actually. And yeah. um, again, I'm not sure how well known this would be, but it really did um, show up on our graphs. It's from the 1950s, I think, so it's been around for a while, but we would all recognise what it means. It characterises that kind of full sense of intimacy that we feel towards a celebrity. And again, particularly during the pandemic, we were watching people's lives unfold on screen because that was pretty much all we had to do. Mm. We we felt very close to them. You know, we all know that experience of seeing a celebrity perhaps on the street saying hello to them because you think you know them. Yeah. So, I've done um, that a few times, Susie, I've got to admit. We've literally got 10 seconds, so I want to know yeah. the word that you would bring back. Oh, easy. I say this all the time. Apricity. Um, I'm sure your weather presenters know. Apricity is the warmth of the sun on your back on a winter's day. Love it. Thank you, Susie. Thanks, Sarah